praise. Shall we all stand as we read the word of God? In Psalms 40, 46 verses 1 down to 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, Behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolation in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your very presence. We acknowledge your presence, O oh God, in our midst. You are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. The mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of peace, O oh God, and Lord, the coming King. We acknowledge you, God, in our, in our lives, Father. Lord, even as we come before your throne of grace and mercy, as we worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, Father, search our hearts, O oh God. Search our hearts. Cleanse, O oh God, everything, O oh God, that displeases you. Thank you, God, that your blood has made us worthy before your eyes. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord that you are faithful to the end and help us to be faithful towards you also. Father, as we come before you, God, we, we pray that we will give our all, the best of God, for you. We want to worship you, Father God. We want to enter into the Holy of Holies, O God, and worship you and bow before you, God, and declare that you are God. You are the King of kings. Thank you, Father God. Lord, saturate this place with your presence. Minister to your people, O God. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to heal the broken hearted, O God. Lord, that you're going you're to heal, Lord, those who are suffering right now, who are sick, O God. Touch their bodies, Lord. Those who are in need, Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh the God that provides. Your Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. Heal us emotionally, O God. Heal us physically. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. This we ask in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let's continue to close our eyes and feel the presence of the Lord in this place. Be still, my soul. Be still, my soul. Cease from.
Amen. I don't know what you're going through or what season you are in your life today, but God is telling us to be still and allow Him to take control of everything. And can we just say, thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. As we continue to worship Him, let us sing songs of praise to our God, for with Him, all things are possible. Amen?
me share to you one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's found in the book of Psalms, chapter 104, verse 33 says, I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will praise, I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Allow me to read it one more time. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Oh, how we love to praise your name, Father. We love to feel your presence. Thank you for your love for us. Search our hearts, oh God. Make our worship pure. And may it be a sweet aroma to you, Lord.
worship a holy God. Amen. Please be seated. Lord, we thank you because you are holy, 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 and yet you invited people who are sinners like us. It is because of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we were able to come into your presence. Thank you. This Christmas, we remember your great love for us. This is the reason of the season. You sent your son because of your love. You love the world so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ. And we who have believed and received him, Lord, we have become children of God. And Lord, thank you for this fellowship. Thank you. This is not just an ordinary fellowship. This is a family. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we pray for those who haven't believed in you yet. We pray for them to believe in the gospel. That Jesus has come to set them free from the bondage of sin. And Lord, in the future, from the presence of sin. But in, in the meantime, Lord, in the here and now, we still are living in a fallen world. We still face struggles and trials and tribulations. But we thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, transform us. Holy Spirit, let your fruit be manifested in us. The fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Let it be manifested in your people. And let your gifts, Lord, different gifts, varied gifts, be used to build the body of Christ. I pray, Lord, for the gifts that are, have been distributed in this church to be used for your glory alone and to edify the church and to move the unbelievers to praise the Father in heaven. Lord, thank you for such a wonderful time. Prepare our hearts as we listen to your word. And thank you for the worship team. Continue to bless their talents that you will use them, Lord, to draw people to you, to worship you alone, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy birthday to those who are celebrating your birthday. Pastor Dave's birthday tomorrow. My birthday in three months. And your birthday. Look forward to your birthday. And baby Saul's birthday today. The son of Zach and Mary. Happy anniversary to those who are celebrating their wedding anniversary. And welcome to those who have come for the first time, no? Katong mga nagbalik-balik na, we welcome you. Now we have come to the last and the seventh metaphorical statement, I am statement of Jesus Christ. So this is a series. If you miss the six, uh, we, have, we have the recording, live stream, no? tech team, multimedia uh, thank you for our multimedia team. Can, can we give a clap to them? Uh, they're getting bigger and uh, more excellent. E even the worship team, a clap for them as well. Thank you. Glory to the Lord, of course. Uh, this is the seventh of the series, and I, I have manuscripts of this and slides. Uh, next, next year, that will be very far, no? Next year, pa long way that's next month i'll be starting the seven churches so pray for me as i study uh i spend at least 10 hours that's the minimum uh, study time for this and pray as well because i'm um i'm studying at koinonia theological seminary it's a foundation and i'm taking up major of master of arts in theology major in missiology and this is the last stretch of the semester so I have eight papers to, one paper you have to read like 12, uh, 12 pages and 800 words to fulfill that reflection for one paper. And one of those is the presentation of my um, uh, defense of my topic, which is uh, burnout of pastors. Uh, this is very real. How to confront uh, and accept that burn burnout is real, real in the pastoral ministry and how to gain resilience and uh, 
became become sustainable in the ministry. So I'm doing, I'm conducting research. Thank you for the pastors who are uh, very responsive in my survey. Uh, please pray because I'll be defending my topic on Thursday with the professors of Koinonia. So medyo kulba kay Morga firing squad for one hour. You have to explain, and these are my first 20 references, which are academic reference. That's what we do in the in the academe, no? Pero hopefully here, I'll not be talking uh, highfalutin words. I just talk about the Word of God and the layman's term. I pray the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Okay, so pray pray for those who are studying theology, and for for students to be. For Brother Don, who will go back to his MDiv this coming January. Uh, Brother Don, Pastor Don, are you here? Ayog kalimot, enroll ha? Ayog kadlok, Master of Divinity. Uh, that will be another two years for him. Listen <laughs> to the seminar. But this is my fifth course. <laughs> I, I'm not tired of studying. So I encourage students to continue studying because... Uh, Paul said, diba? In season and out of season. Si Ate Madel is also doing her <laughs> lots of paperwork and readings. I have a book review as well. <laughs> and three pages lang po ang reflection mo with that thick book. And then you respond by just writing three pages. It's very difficult. So let's go back to our sermon, the seventh metaphorical I am statement of Jesus. As a way of review... Let's read what we learned. No? Ito po yung seven. So let's have the seven. Uh, thank you, Jay. So uh, before that, let's never forget the scripture reading. So uh, responsive reading, add numbers for the ladies. No? Uh, verse 1 up to 11. And then 2, 4, 6, mga men. Let's begin with the ladies. Ready? Begin. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask of every fish and it will be like me. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Everyone, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. May the Lord bless all of us as we continue to reflect and understand and let the Holy Spirit teach us the Word. So this, this is the summary of the seven statements of Jesus, metaphorical. It's a figurative way of saying, I am the bread, I am the light of the world, the door of the sheep, good shepherd, resurrection, the life. And last uh, two Sundays ago, the way, the truth, three Sundays ago, the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, finally, number seven, I am the vine. This is the longest, this is the longest for me, nine, nine pages of my manuscript. So I hope I can focus on my manuscript. No, uh, no anything, no, no sideways and byways. Okay, so let's review the claim number one. Ladies, please read. Ready, begin. Men, please. Jesus' claim, I am the light of the world, means that being the Son of God, 
He is the light of the world who can provide divine truth and spiritual illumination to those who believe in him. Third, ladies, again. Men, Jesus' claim, I am the good shepherd, means that he is the only savior of the world, both for the Jews and Gentiles, who offered his life for our salvation, and knowing him intimately, follows thereafter. Women, please. Six men, Jesus' claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life, means that he is men. He is the only way to heaven. Men, are you still there? Or Sorry, uh, ready, begin. Jesus' claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life, means that he is the only way to heaven and none other. That by him, the true God is revealed. And that eternal life is received and experienced in Him alone. Thank you for uh, the reading. You know, the story of Jesus' life, everything about Him, His public ministry, His, uh, uh, from, from the birth, no, infancy, to, to His boyhood when He was 12 in the silent years, meaning no, no record in the Gospels. Uh, his his uh, teachings, and then his time with his disciples, the public ministry, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection and ascension are all narrated by the four Gospels in different perspectives. So different angle, like when there's a, an event there, somebody is on the 10th floor, iba yung perspective niya. Somebody who is like just stone throw away, iba yung perspective. Somebody who just heard, never saw it, but he heard something is going on, Iba yung perspective. But the, the four, where, where uh, they were authentic and genuine witnesses of Jesus Christ. And so, this, this story of the life of Jesus is recorded historically. And the most historical, and in, in the secular world, the most scholarly work in, in history is the book of Luke. I, I'm not telling Matthew and Mark and John are, are not that secularly accepted. There are a lot of uh, facts that prove that these are genuine uh, writings of the first-hand witnesses of Jesus. But if we consider the Gospel of John, where we base our series, this, this seven I am statements of Jesus, the metaphorical I am statement, it begins in verse 1 with, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus was the Word. And this Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's, there's no apologizing here. And then in verse 14, we jump. The Word became flesh. This Word who was with God and who was God, eternally present before time, before the creation of the heavens and earth, before, before the time began. Because time started when there was the sun and the moon. That marks the season. Before that, Jesus was already there. He is with God. He was God. And yet in verse 14 of John chapter 1, this word, capital W, logos, that's in Greek. Because in Greek, they, they have this logos who, are, who is impersonal. Logos who is high and above, and, but impersonal. You cannot relate with logos. But for John, logos became person, became flesh in verse 14. And he dwelt among us. So the God who is with God, who was really God before time began, became part of creation. He was born. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It doesn't mean that he was born December. It could mean that he was born in March or April, the time of spring, the time that is not winter in, in Israel, in Palestine. Uh, his scholars say probably March or April, the celebration of the Passover. Because they don't celebrate Passover in December. For you to know. That's why there are people who don't celebrate Christmas in December. 
because of the argument that Jesus was not born in December, probably March or April, the celebration of Passover. But I don't care about the date. What I care is the essence of celebration that God became human beings. If you eradicate the celebration, then you don't celebrate the incarnation that Jesus, who is God, became human. And so John was very clear with that. That's why let me quote John Stott. Also John, he, write, he, writes the, the, he wrote the book Incomparable Christ in uh, page 35, and I quote, The Creator assumed the human frailty of His creatures. The Eternal One entered time. The All-Powerful made Himself vulnerable. The All-Holy exposed Himself to temptation. And in the end, the immortal died. The great paradox. No? He was God and yet became human. He was holy. But he, he, became, he was tempted by Satan. And he is immortal and yet he died. That's a great paradox. This is the one we worship and adore, our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the seventh metaphorical I am statement, Jesus used the vine, the vine which is one of the, the richest analogies of the Jewish people. Now let me begin by citing the importance of vineyard, no? the vine. What is the importance of vineyard? Where it is grown, how it is cultivated, how is it how is it protected? And how is the vineyard uh, protected and cared for so that you can have maximum yield? Uh, grapes money. Um, fruits of uh, vine, grapes, diba? vineyard. So let's, let's look at the importance of, of the vine. The vine branches were usually allowed. Uh, vines are important for domestic, economic, and religious life of Israel. It was grown in the ancient Egypt and in Canaan even before the time of Abraham. Now, before Abraham came in Genesis 14, Numbers 13, there was already vineyard no, in, in Canaan. That's the old name of Israel, Canaan. When God called Abraham from Ur, and then they traveled to Haran. From Haran, his father died, Terah. But uh, Abraham decided to move from Genesis 12. He was told by God, I will give you three blessings. You move to this place I will show you. And so he arrived in Canaan. And this place was already full of vineyards. There are already, already grapes, no? The mountain regions of Judea and Samaria, largely unsuited for grain or wheat, no? Kanang murag sa atua, rice, rice laha, grain or wheat, were well adapted for vine growing. So the mountainous part, hills, they have to grow and vineyard. A vineyard was usually surrounded with a protecting wall of stones or thorny hedges to keep out destructive animals. In every vineyard was a tower for the watchman. So these are precious uh, agricultural uh, products. Why? There's a tower for a guard. There's a hedge and a wall to protect from destructive animals. And uh, in every vineyard, uh, there, there will be a vat into which the juice flowed from the wine press, there's there's a wine press. Usually, when they harvest kanang grapes, tamak tamakan lang na nila. And there's that uh, there's a vat that will the, the juice will flow into that vat. It's a container made of stone. That that's that's uh, that's the way of producing juice. And later, it will be fermented naturally. There's an alcohol content, but not, unlike the wine today that is high in alcohol. That's a natural fermentation. They get the wine, uh, fermented wine. So that's, that's a process of producing wine. The vine branches were usually allowed to lie along the ground or to fall over the terraces. But sometimes they were raised above the ground with sticks or supported on poles to form a bower. Bower is like a shelter. No? Uh, it's like shade. So there are sticks and then it's allowed to... Uh, to Katai there, no? So you, you see that? And you can go underneath and then feel it's like a shelter. That's a bower. Now, vineyards, the vine requires constant care. These are high maintenance uh, agricultural products, no? Kaning, kaning uh, vineyard. It's a uh, high, high maintenance, like, like women, high maintenance. Also, men are high maintenance, no? 
mga lalaki. <laughs> Hindi lang babae. We are high maintenance. The highest maintenance are the kids. Pagpakarato din yung mga bata. The youth, they are very high maintenance. <laughs> Gasto kayo. Congratulations to Attorney Te- Judge Te- for the Apo. Uh, yeah. uh, you have now the Apo, both of you. Uh, Dr. Ro has just born a child, his wife. Okay, <laughs> let's go back. The grapes were an important part of the diet of the Hebrews. A part of the harvest was preserved in the form of raisin cakes. Let's look at these raisin cakes. So these are raisin cakes no? in the ancient Israel. And then some, are, uh, pre- uh, this, some products are sugar. Uh, byproducts of grapes can be sugar. No? Because uh, they don't have sugar cane. Uh, Promegenics or, or grapes are the source of sugar for, for the Palestinians, for the Jews, the Israelites. The juice of the grapes was drunk fresh or fermented, as I said. So th- those are the byproducts. And during the Passover order, uh, the, the Jews drink at least four cups, four cups of, of uh, fermented uh, wine. Fermented grapes, which are called wine. Uh, the name is wine. And the Jews drink at least four cups of wine from the prayer of blessing. That's the beginning, the first cup, to the singing of Hallel Sam. Diba? If you read, they sang a hymn. Pero na miss yung ibang cups. Actually, on the third cup, which is the symbol of the blood of the lamb that was in the doorpost when in Egypt, the tenth plague, uh, the Lord Yahweh said, uh, sprinkle blood on your doorpost because the angel of death will pass by, pass through and when the angel sees the blood on the doorpost you will be passed over lagpasan mo lagpasan, lagpasan no? no? dili na mo mamatay ang firstborn ana na household when that angel of death sees that there is the blood on the doorpost, the blood of the lamb that's the third cup that's the third cup when Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, drink. So, so apat. Pero hindi sila nalasing. Why? Natural fermentation, very low content ng alcohol, unlike the wine we have, 14 or 17% alcohol, medyo lipong na ka, no? Masa ganyan, ka ng mga wine, nga lami. Na ang may wine sa Christmas. No? Lami na siya. Yes. Uh, so, but Jesus turned this Passover celebration into the Eucharist, which we know as Holy Communion. From the Passover celebration for thousands of years, and when the Last Supper, when they spent that time in the upper room, Jesus turned this centennial or millennia long history of celebrating the Passover into something different. When was when was the when were they liberated from 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 Egypt? What was the time? The time of Moses. It was very long time. And then when they were in the wilderness forty years, they crossed the Jordan. And when the first king Saul became king, and then second David, it was one thousand years before Jesus. Imagine the length of the celebration of Passover. But when Jesus came, he said, "I will." Turn this Passover celebration into the Lord's Supper. Uh, that's, that's my own word. This is now a symbol of my blood. A new covenant, covenant in my blood. Because I am the Messiah. I have come to fulfill what the Old Testament has been saying about. Now that we know the significance of the vine, let's proceed to the seventh metaphorical statement of Jesus. In the first verse of chapter 15, because we are looking at John 15, the claim of Jesus to be the true Israel, he says, I am the true vine. You know, he was referring to the Old Testament text. Let's look at two vineyard songs, no? the Luang vineyard songs. The first song is in Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one has a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. How, now, you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, 
judge between me and my vineyard. What more could you have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I look for good grapes, what did it yield? Only bad. Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. It will be destroyed. I will break down its walls and it will be trampled. Hmm? Trampled? Ganon <laughs> talaga. It's a waste. I will make it a wasteland. Neither pruned nor cultivated. And briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty, who is this? Is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The vineyard is Israel. Now, that's in the first song of the vineyard. In verses 18 to 23, I did not include here, chapter 5, Prophet Isaiah issues four woes, no, four laments over God's people, Israel, because even if God delighted in His people, even if God showed His blessing to them, they rejected Him. And Israel not just rejected Him, but despised Him. This reflects the rejection of the Messiah in Isaiah 53 verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. The, this, the rejection of Israel with, with, with God, no, the God of the covenant, their rejection ultimately found its highest expression when they rejected Jesus Christ. And so we heard last Sunday that the Israel now is still the apostate Israel. They still in their unbelief. They didn't believe in the Messiah. They're still waiting. Uh, where is the Messiah? We want the political Messiah. We want to have a Messiah who, who is born in the palace. Somebody who is in the purple carpet. Who, is, who wears the purple color. Not in the manger. Not wearing ordinary clothes. They walk at home white cloth. You will see a baby wrapped in a cloth, an ordinary cloth. They're not expect, um, expecting someone like that. They expect a Messiah who is clothed with a purple color, a, a very expensive cloth. Somebody born in the palace. But Jesus wasn't born there. And so they remain in their unbelief. You know, the vineyard song in chapter 5 is Isaiah's diagnosis of Judah's spiritual decline. And he, he gave a description of his generation, of generation of apostasy. A generation who are remaining in their sin, rebellious. A generation full of injustice. Uh, a house of rebels, according to Ezekiel. They are a house of rebels. Panimalay sa mga... Dili NPA. Panimalay sa mga rebelde. Panimalay sa mga rebelde. And they still remain in their unbelief. And so, because of the consequence of their unbelief, God did not find good grapes, but bad grapes. So God allowed destruction to fall upon them because of idolatry. Apostasy is caused by idolatry. Huh? If you become apostate if you don't worship the true God. They already know the true God, and yet they worship another God. God's no? who are not breathing, who are not living. That's apostasy. You know the living God, and yet you deny Him. That's apostasy. You turn back your, 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 you turn your back on, on that living God. That's apostasy. And this is what Israel did. And so, because of their violence and injustice, the full blow of God's judgment happened. Where? During the fall of Jerusalem. When? In 586 B.C. That's historical. Nebuchadnezzar, allowed his army, he was there to conquer Jerusalem and then uh, Jerusalem was ground zero. It was burned including the temple of Solomon. And so the result of that, the, the cream of the crop were brought to Babylon including Daniel and his friends and the priests and others and, and many were scattered. That's a diaspora. In 586 BC, they were scattered around the world. The owner of Merco is a Jew. He is one of the diaspora. The owner of Merco is, is a Jew who married a Filipina. Of course, you know Merco. You have tasted their, their cakes. 
many Jews were scattered because of this event. But in 1947, 46, we know they came back and became a nation, as we have heard in the sermon last, last Sunday. It's a long scattering, no? There are still a lot of Jews scattered in Europe, in Asia right now, in the West, and they're coming back. The second vineyard song is found in Isaiah 27, 2-6. Let me read. In that day, sing about the fruitful vine. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I am not angry. If only there were briars and thorns confronting me, I would march against them in battle. I would set them all on fire. Or else let them come to me for refuge. Let them make peace with me. Yes, let them make peace with me. In the days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. You know, this is an opposite picture of chapter 5, the first vineyard song that we've, we've uh, heard. The vineyard song in chapter 27, you know, is a future picture of a redeemed and a renewed Israel. Let me repeat that. This is the picture of not Israel now, not the Israel today. Warring with Palestinians. It's not the Israel in the present. This is a picture of a redeemed and a renewed Israel and where it becomes so fruitful. It, take, it took root, it buds, and it blossomed and bare much fruit. It bore fruit that it will fill the whole world with good fruit. It will be a good influence to the nations. Israel will be the light to the nations. That's, that's a... That's a uh, actually, this is a fulfillment of their, their role to be the light to the nations. And they will share their fruit, their good fruit. This will happen once Israel is regathered, as Prophet Isaiah tells us in verses 12 to 13. In that day, the Lord will thresh from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt, and you, Israel, will be gathered up one by one. Actually, this is the geographical map, no? From Egypt, the bottom, the south, to, to the... Euphrates, no? river. This, this is the whole geographical map of Israel. The Lord will gather them back. Those who were, and in that day a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria, those who were exiled in Egypt, will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. They will go back to their land. It's happening now. A lot of Jews are coming back. Because of the rise of anti-Semitism, you know, hatred of the Jews is, is back. They are being stoned, they are being ridiculed anywhere in London, anywhere, in, in the, especially in, the, in Europe. And so they're going back, they're deciding to go back, but it's not yet the full measure. They're still deciding to go back, and it's happening. Let's wait for that. The Apostle Paul confirms this in the first letter to the Thessalonian believers. When will this happen fully? No? The realization of Isaiah 27. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a, with, a, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Verse 13 of chapter 27, Isaiah. In that day, a great trumpet will sound. That's the sound. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we will be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord. That will be the fulfillment. That's the time of fulfillment. The second vineyard song of Isaiah, found in chapter 27, as I said, is a direct uh, contrast to chapter 5, the first vineyard song. Because in chapter 5, Israel was unfaithful. Israel was unfruitful. But in, it was only good for trampling, for destruction, to be left as a wasteland. But in chapter 27 of Isaiah, it became fruitful and good. It is full of righteousness. It is full of justice. It is full of the glory of God. Direct opposite. Now this will happen, actually. This will really happen. And so when Jesus claims, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener, 
The disciples understood that he was telling them about the first vineyard song in Isaiah. And he was actually looking forward to the second vineyard song in chapter 27. Jesus was clearly discussing about the failure of Israel as the vineyard of God. And so when he said in chapter 15 verse 1, I am the true vine, the disciples understood. That is, he was claiming that I am the true Israel. Because in Isaiah 5 and Isaiah 27, the vineyard, uh, it, it, it refers to Israel. So when Jesus said, I am the true vine, he was claiming, I will be the true Israel who will be loyal to my God, who will not be disloyal like you. I will be absolutely loyal to the Father till the end. I will follow the Father's will. Jesus was saying that. And the disciples understood his words. And so when he claimed that, the disciples were just listening. And when he claims, I am the true vine and the Father is the gardener, they fully understood that the fulfillment of Isaiah 27 is beginning. Because Jesus already unleashed the kingdom of God. He inaugurated the kingdom of God when he came. And so the disciples were happy. He is the true Israel who took root. He blossomed and bare much fruit, bore fruit. Later, the apostle Paul quotes a familiar hymn in the first century that shows that Jesus absolutely submitted to the Father. Where can you find that? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in appearance of a man, as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on the cross. The ultimate picture of surrender of Jesus to the Father is the cross, the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. We don't have a cross here. But the cross symbolizes the full surrender of the Son. He was obedient till the end. And He is the true vine or true Israel. Jesus was assembling the renewed 12 tribes of Israel Symbolized by the chosen 12? No? Yung 12. Bakit? He intended to choose 12. Why? Because they are the new Israel with the 12 tribes. Jesus is the true Israel with the 12 tribes. Replacing Reuben, Judah, uh, Levi, no? Sim, Simon, Simeon, Judah, everyone. He was replacing them by the 12 tribes he chose. But you know, eventually one betrayed him and fell. So what, who remained? The, the 11 remained. And so in this last installment of the I Am Statement of Jesus, let's look closely to what Jesus will tell His disciples, the 11 who remain. And, uh, you know, in verses 3 to 11 of John 15, let's look closely. Uh, the setting of this claim, uh, for us not to be lost, it was in the upper room. Uh, uh, go back to that. Thank you, Jay. With 11 disciples, because Judas was already, uh, was already decided to leave. These words are addressed to his disciples who are already saved. Uh, let me emphasize that. The words Jesus said in John 15 are for the born again. Those who have relationship in Jesus Christ. And so the words that I will be describing to you is for the believers. It's not for unbelievers. It's for those who have believed and received Jesus. This is the setting. The 11 were there. They were the first hand audience of the words of Jesus. Now let's go to the sixth implication of being in the vine. What does it mean if you are part of the true Israel? So this is what it means. Number one, Jesus cleansed the disciples through the word that he has spoken to them. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you in verse 3. Jesus' words are the truth that sets them free from the bandage of Satan's lies Blindness caused by sin and deafness because of spiritual death. The psalmist echoes the same a millennium earlier in Psalm 1, uh, John 17, 17, before I read Psalm 119, Jesus prayed, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Ito yung high priestly prayer of Jesus. And the psalmist uh, a thousand years earlier wrote Psalm 119 verse 9, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? He answers the question by living 
according to your word. Today, it is the, still the word of God that purifies and sanctifies believers. It's still the Bible. It is still the word. It is still the scripture that transforms us through the power of the Holy Spirit. God cannot work in an empty vessel, in an empty mind. God, the Holy Spirit, works through you because you are filled with the Word of God. He can transform you using the Word of God, the promises, the commands, the examples, even the bad examples. The Holy Spirit will remind you, don't do what this person did in, in that character in the Bible. It is the Word of God that is used by, by the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. Jesus spoke the word of God. He spoke the truth that sets us free. We have his words through the scripture in the Bible. Again, Paul emphasizes his truth when he writes to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. Can we read together? Ready? Begin. Okay, thank you. Don't forget that. 316 also, 2 Timothy. Remember, salvation is a one-time event, but sanctification is lifetime. This is what 2 Timothy 316 is telling us. You need to be corrected. Now first, you need to be taught. You need to be rebuked. You need to be corrected. You need to be equipped. Now, it's, it's a full sanctification process. Salvation one time, sanctification lifetime. And this is the sanctification process, 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, the Word of God will teach us the ways of God. The Word of God will rebuke us from our tendency to be rebellious, no? to do rebellious acts. The Word of God will correct us from misconceptions. We have a lot of ideas that are not actually sync, in sync to the Word of God. That's why the Word of God will correct you. It's a wrong, it's a misconception. It's actually wrong doctrine. So the Word of God will correct us, misconception. It will train us to live righteous lives. And the Word of God will fully equip us to do good works. So that in Matthew 5.16, it will result to people praising the Father in heaven. Is the Word of God lacking? Completo. It will teach you to guide you to the paths of righteousness. It will rebuke you of your rebellious tendencies. It will correct you of your misconceptions. Ang daming turo ngayon, no? We can go to the social media and just believe anything. But you know, the Word of God will correct those wrong teachings. And it will equip us as a body of Christ to be ready to do good work so that people outside will praise the Father in heaven. There are two sides to sanctification. Oh, we're talking about sanctification. Number one, sanctification is a... Uh, next slide, uh, Jay. It is for pur purification. That's the first uh, side of sanctification. Involves separation from, from uncleanness and impurity. Holiness demands, demands that we avoid doing certain things. In Ephesians, Paul says, take off the old clothes. The sinful nature, take it off. You have to be holy. That's the first stage. The first side of sanctification. The second side is consecration. It means separation to God and to His service. Holiness demands that we actively pursue doing certain things, other things. Instead of lying, you need to tell the truth. Instead of being lazy, you need to have work so that you can be generous to others. Instead of backbiting, you have to affirm and encourage. Right? Old clothes, new clothes in Ephesians. This is consecration. And it means service to the Lord. Romans chapter 12. Your body is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Now you are ready to serve as a student, as, as a prof professional, as a business person. As a household keeper, wherever God has placed you, everything in you is about worship. That's consecration. You offer your talent as a living sacrifice to the Lord. First is choosing not to live in sin. Second is choosing to serve God. Those are the two sides. 
two coins, sides of two, one coin, and that is sanctification. And so my question is this. Are you immersing yourself in the study and meditation of the Word of God? Do you obey Christ's instructions when you read a, pro a command? Do you obey it right away? Do you seriously listen to the Spirit's voice and obey at once? The Spirit will whisper. Do you obey at once? Are you being purified and consecrated daily? The children are not exempted. Whether you are in the business, whether you are a government worker, a private worker, you are working in the corporate world, everyone, we are called into serious study of the Word of God because God uses the Word to sanctify us, purify and consecrate His people. Second, as branches, the disciples must remain or abide in Jesus, the vine, to bear fruit. Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It, it must remain in the vine. So, yun yung sabi ni Jesus. Fruitfulness is a result of remaining or abiding in Jesus. That's common sense. Di man na mamunga ang sanga kung na detach na na, kung napotol na ng sanga, di na na mamunga. It has always to be connected. That's common sense. But it has to be uh, it has to be emphasized. You have to be in the vine, the branch, so that you can bear fruit. This is what Jesus is telling the disciples. You know, even for the disciples and even for us, fruitfulness is dependent on abiding in Jesus. Don't separate yourself from Jesus. If we separate ourselves from Jesus, we cannot bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Much fruit, he says. No branch can bear fruit if it is detached from the vine. So, and so to be fruitful as a disciple, we must experience genuine conversion. There are fake Christians. I'm sorry to tell that. There are Christians who go to church and they profess to be like Christians, but they're not bearing fruit. They are not genuine. They say something like Christians talk, Christian talk. You see, they dress like Christians, but you cannot see the fruit in them. Beware. Genuine conversion must happen. It is noteworthy that in verse 2, Jesus right away defines the role of the Father as the gardener or vine dresser. Jesus says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Sa dili mamunga, putlon. Sa mamunga, iprun. No? Ang pruning is not, is actually just cutting a portion but not the branch. Ang cutting is the whole branch is cut and thrown away. Bring. So that's the role of the father. It is the father's role to take care of the vine for maximum productivity. He prunes it, plows the ground, takes off the weeds. Then he throws the fruitless branches away because it will consume the nutrients from the vine. The branches that does not bear fruit like coffee, coffee should be pruned in the spring, the same with the vineyard, so that the cherry, coffee cherry, will, will get the nutrients full. It will not be the branch that will get the nutrients. That's why there's the pruning process. So the father is the one who, who cuts the, the fruitless branch and the branch that is bearing fruit, he will prune. It's, it's a painful process. You know, in the earlier chapter, Jesus plainly tells his listeners that he and the Father gives eternal security because they are equal in status as God. In John 10, 27 to 20, let's read that. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can shut them out from my Father's hand. The first, in verse 28, from Jesus' hands, no one can snatch. In verse 29, from the Father's hands, no one can snatch. I, I and the Father are one. We are God. We are equal in status. Those who are in us, those who believe in us, 
will be eternally secure. You will never lose salvation when you are in Christ. Amen? Ayaw na kahadlok nga mawagtang imong kaluwasan. Once you believe, John 1, 1, 12. Once you receive Him and you believe in His name, you become children of God. You are a child of God and eternally you are secure. Uh, uh, 20 or so year, years later, the Apostle Paul write, wrote to the Roman believers in chapter 8, 35, 38 to 39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword? No! All In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, life, angels, demons, neither present, future, nor any powers, neither height, depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No one can separate us. Position, possession, place, person, nobody. Superhuman or not superhuman cannot separate us from the salvation that we have in Christ. This is, this is true. And so if you are a genuine believer who experienced genuine conversion, you will not be a branch that will be cut and burned in the fire. You will not be. You will be a branch that will be pruned so that you will become fruitful. You will be that branch. So my friends, fellow believers, don't be afraid. You are secure in the hands of God. But you know, there is a sad reality. As I said, those who don't remain in Jesus, they became useless. They will be thrown away. They wither. They will be picked up. They will be thrown in the fire and burned, as verse 6 says. The branches that don't bear fruit refer to those who are unfaithful and in the first place, faithless. Because in the, they don't have a real saving relationship with Jesus. One of those branches that was taken away, some of the commentators say, is Judas Iscariot. As clearly pointed out by Jesus when he washed the disciples' feet in John 13, 10 to 11. Those who have a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean. Though not every one of you. The clean there means you are already saved. You are eternally secure. You are not condemned. But one of you is condemned. For he knew who was going to betray him. And what that was why he said not everyone was clean. The Apostle Paul in Romans 10 writes that the preaching of the gospel is needed for people to hear it and respond by believing in it. But there are really some who heard the preaching of the gospel but remained in their unbelief. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the name the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Sent, preach, hear, believe. That's a process. If nobody is sent to preach the gospel, nobody can hear and believe it. But you know, the last verse is very sad. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. The prophets were, were sent. Jesus was sent. They heard the gospel preach the kingdom of God. They still remained in their unbelief. There are a lot of professing Christians in the past today who are not really born again. I'm sorry to say that. There are a lot who go to church who are not really saved. We cannot point to them. God knows. God knows their heart. They can act like Christians, talk like one, but they are not genuinely saved. The fire mentioned in verse 6, chapter 15 of John, refers to God's judgment that will come to them at the appointed time as it always does. We must remind ourselves that nothing is hidden from the eyes of God. Everything is laid bare. 
He sees every intent of the heart. He can tell you, he can tell what's in the person. He can tell if that person is genuinely saved or not. The Apostle Paul writes about God's righteous judgment in 2 Thessalonians 1. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. For which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. That's the fire there. It will, they will be burned in the fire. This is the flaming fire. The judgment inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who did not respond to the preaching of the gospel. They will be judged eventually. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of His might. This is horrible picture. This is horrendous, to say the least. You heard the gospel, and yet you did not believe. You just make believe. Pakitang tao lang. Okay lang. Because of this relationship, I just go there. Uh, to save my face. No, no, no. It's about your eternal destiny. It's about your salvation. If you don't accept the gospel, this will be the faith of the unbelievers. Those who have not, no, did not respond genuinely to the preaching of the gospel. And so when Jesus mentions about the fruit, let's go to the fruit. He is referring to the primary fruit of the Spirit. What is this fruit? He mentions it many times. It is the, the fruit of love. This is mentioned in verse 9, 10, 12, and 13. We have to consider the context, the whole passage, when we interpret something. And the fruit he was talking about is the fruit of love. This is mentioned in verses 9, 10, 12, and 13. He repeats it. He, he repeats the word many times. Another fruit is joy mentioned in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full or complete or abounding. Almost two decades later, the Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Galatia, Highlighting the first two fruit that Jesus mentioned in John 15. But the fruit of the Spirit, the first two listed there. Love. Can we read that? Ready? Begin. Love. Joy. Peace. Forbearance. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. Against these things there is no law. The pruning of branches then to bear much fruit is to refine our character. You will ask, Nganong iprun man ko, nga sakit man kaayo. So that will be, you will go through the refiner's fire. That's the crucible. The gold will not be pure gold without the fire. Somebody asked an aluminum maker, how do you know that the aluminum is 100% aluminum? The answer of that aluminum maker, processor, when I see my reflection in that aluminum. That's what Jesus is doing in us. The Father is pruning us so that Jesus' reflection will be seen in you and me. That's the pruning process. God allows that. And so here the pruning begins. And uh, to make the fruit of the Spirit evident in each one of us, we have to go through tribulations. It's not punishment. It's a way of God to refine us, our character and to make us more Christ-like. Regarding fruitlessness, Matthew Henry comments, this is the one commentary I consulted, from a vine we look for grapes, and from a Christian we look for Christianity. This is the fruit, a Christian temper and disposition, a Christian life and conversion, Christian devotions and Christian designs. We must honor God, do good, exemplify the purity and power of the religion we profess, and this is bearing fruit and quote. From conversion, where's the first fruit of the Spirit, you are converted, and then you bear the character of Christ. You live like Christ. Your character is displayed. You become the light of the world. You become the salt of the earth. Because Christ in you becomes the glorious Christ. He will be lifted high in your life. 
in what you do, in your words and your actions. And so my question is this. Are you bearing fruit or not? Have you truly received Jesus and believe this is the day of salvation? Don't let it pass. Those who are online, receive the Lord Jesus. Make him your savior. Follow him as your Lord. Lifetime. Can others tell that you are a child of God by your words and actions? Third, I may go beyond the time. Third, remaining in Jesus who is the true wine, having his word in the disciples, assures answers to prayer. Jesus said, ask whatever you wish, it will be done to you. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Pagkalami ani nga saad egzoon. Unsa pa may inyong pangayoon? Now, ask whatever. Ask whatever you may ask me for anything in the name of Jesus. And I will do it. Whatever your prayer. Fruitful believers who love God, love their neighbors and themselves will have ready answers when they pray according to the Father's will. In the name of Jesus. Because what they ask for will bring glory to the Father. Let me quote again Arnold Frachtenboom, a Messianic Jew. With these words, Yeshua established a new basis of prayer to pray and ask in His name. Asking in Yeshua's name means to ask based on His authority. That's why when we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Why? Because we're praying in the authority of Jesus. We're praying for His sake and because of the believer's relationship with Him. And so when you pray, you say, Our Father, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's based on relationship. Our Father. If you are not part of the family, you cannot pray to the Father. You are not invited. You are not praying in the authority of Jesus because you don't have relationship with Jesus. And so everything starts with receiving Jesus. Everything starts by believing in Jesus as the Lord, as the Savior. Because when you do that, you have the privilege of praying in His name, in His authority, and claiming His promises. What do you usually pray for? On some my content sa tatong pagampo, what are the items in our prayer? Are your prayers being answered? Sa may akong giampo last month, magawa man yun na tubag, parang walang sinagot si Lord. Check your prayer. What's the motive behind what you're praying for? Are you praying in authority of Jesus? In the authority of Jesus? Are you praying in accordance with the Father's will or not? Are you praying to please your ego just for your sake? Or are you praying really to glorify God? Those are the questions for us. Fourth, bearing much fruit does two things. Authenticates genuine discipleship and glorifies the Father. Jesus says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As mentioned earlier, the fruit referred to in this passage is love. The authentication genuine discipleship. As Jesus admonishes his disciples earlier in chapter 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I, love, as I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. By that love, if you love one another. And so this fruit of love, it, it, if it is manifested in us, will testify that we are really genuine disciples of Christ. John Stott mentions the three tests of counterfeit Christians based on the first epistle of John. Doctrinal test. Whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh is a liar. Kadong musopak nga si Cristo incarnate nga God dili sila tinuod. They are, they didn't pass the doctrinal test. Number two, moral test. Whoever claims to enjoy fellowship with God while walking in darkness lies. If you live a sinful life, even if you proclaim you are a Christian, you don't pass. You did not pass the moral test. The third test, social test. Whoever says he loves God but hates his brother is a liar. If you don't love your brother, if you don't love your sister in the Lord, you don't pass the social test. 
And so the doctrinal, moral, social test mentioned by Stott, based on the first epistle of John, determines our genuine faith, our genuine faith in Christ. And so reflect honestly, do you pass the doctrinal, moral, and social test? Are you a genuine disciple of Jesus who exudes love? Do you bring glory to God by bearing the fruit of love? Fifth, Jesus reminds his disciples to remain in his love and to keep his commands, which is the full expression of their love. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love if you could, uh, if, by keeping my commandments. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. You know, this is just an echo of John 14. If you love me, keep my commands. This is just an echo of that. Verse 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to them and make our home with them. We will be a dwelling place of the Father and the Son and the Spirit if we love. Wow. What's up my kulang sa paghigugma egsoon? The Trinity will be dwelling in you if you love one another. What's up my kulang? You want the Trinity to be present in your life manifested? Love. 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 That's the only command. Now what makes this commandment great? In Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Jesus was asked, What's the greatest commandment? And the reply of Jesus is this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love. Love God. Love neighbor. Also yourself. What makes this commandment great? And what part of this commandment is, is very hard to follow? What do you think? What is hard to, to obey? If, if you really look to that commandment. Is loving God very hard? Is loving yourself hard? Is loving others hard? We, we can answer that. Sixth and last, we go to the last part. Jesus told these things to his disciples to ensure that his joy will be in them and that their joy will be complete. I have told you this so that your joy may be in you. The Greek word for joy is kara. Kadang charismatic kara, no? The same. That Jesus is offering his disciples kara is abounding and full measure. This comes out of the revelation that he shared to his disciples about himself and the Father, you remember the job description of Jesus in John 10.10? 10, I have come so that you will have life, life to the full, abundant life. And so when we are part of the true vine, Jesus, we have abundant life that is characterized by love and joy. If you look at a Christian, if you want me to describe a Christian, just two words. That person is loving and that person is joyful. Manifestation of the character of God, the character of love, and the character of joy. Joy is not dependent of the happenings of the season. Joy is always there, even in trials. Joy is there. It will give you hope. And so, but we will ask, why are there miserable Christians around? God expects us to be filled with joy and, and love, but, but you know, the enemy is a kill joy. Satan doesn't want Christians to be joyful. Magtanaw sa nemo, magsilos siya. Anong malipayon man si Chan? Si Dono, oh, malipayon lagi kayo sa iyang marriage. Kami, akong misis, si Lapa. Anong malipayon man na sila, Pastor? Ako ning daoton. Anong ang busy ay malipayon man na ako ning gubuton? E nga ang enemy, kill joy. And he can use people around. He can use even your loved ones. Because we still live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is fallen. We are being attacked by Satan in his cohorts. We live in a worldly system. And the flesh in us succumbs easily to the temptation. 
That's why there are miserable Christians. We still are living in between the ages. The evil age and the age to come. And so let me conclude. When we are living in the, in the meantime, no? we are living in the two ages. I don't know if we have the illustration here. Jay, the next. Oh, let me go to the last quote from John Stott, the contemporary Christian. And I quote, Caught between the present and the future, the characteristic stance of Christians is variously described as hoping, we are hoping, we are waiting, we are still longing, and we are still groaning. Huh? Why? Because evil is still present. We can conquer sin sometimes, but there are times we fall in temptation. The presence of sin is still here, but the power has been conquered by Jesus. But eventually, that power and presence will be eradicated. Eventually, but not yet now. So while we hope, wait, groan, long and groan, let's abide and remain in Jesus. That's the only way we can win against this battle. Against Satan and his cohorts, against the worldly system, against the, the, the flesh that succumbs to temptation. Let's remain in the vine. Let's be faithful to Him. Let's love Him with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. Let's love other people, obey His commands, endure trials, and make Him known to others. Preach the gospel. By your deeds and by your words, let others know that Jesus died for them and anticipate His coming again. Why? When you anticipate His coming, you will be vigilant, you will be alert. You will not live in sin. Why? Jesus can appear anytime. If you are living in sin and the Lord comes and caught you, catch you, it will be a shame. Diba? But if you expect, eh, na ang hari anytime, you are always ready. Diba? The president is coming to this place. Okay, uh, behave, dress well. Inga na mana. Diba? A dignitary is coming. The dignitary is coming. Be prepared. Ayo pagluya luya. In conclusion, we learn that as the true Israel who absolutely obeyed the Father's will, Jesus is inviting us to abide in Him, to be fruitful, to ask anything in His name according to the Father's will, continually love each other, which authenticates genuine discipleship, thereby glorifying God, and to experience abundant life by having complete joy. This is the result of the revelation of Jesus and the Father in you and in me through His Word. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. for that message, Pastor June. You know those claims by Christ, more than just the thing that we know, it is something that all believers need to really see, not only with eyes, but in the eyes of the Spirit. So thank you for those seven messages, na, diba? the claims of Jesus. You know why we're powerful as God's people? Because it is God Himself who told us way ahead who He really is. And I want to encourage us to go back to the notes that we have. Pinapadala ni, ni Pastor Junior sa lahat. Review that. And I believe being people of Christ, we need to be more than knowledgeable. It had to be very personal to us. Amen? As we share our tithes and offerings, you know, this morning as I woke up, I remember an old hymn, something na naalala ko way, way back in 1984 when I came to know the Lord. You know, the lyric says, Shout, shout joyfully unto God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praises glorious. And it repeats itself when it says, Joyfully, joyfully, all the earth shall worship Thee. When we give our best to God, let's also remember that we're coming near to celebrating Christmas. And we realize that 
the wisest man of their time went there to give gifts. And they traveled long and far to give not only gifts from their very heart, but symbols of what it was going to be. We'll be sharing that as Christmas comes. But let me just share you something we know, but we need to really put in our heart. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let me read from verse 6. It says here, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. When you realize this before I pray, Paul reminded those people and even us now about sowing. Now most of us realize that it's like a simple way, not only gardening but planting. As we give to God from our heart, we're also sowing seeds for ourselves. Kaya sabi niya, pag nagsow ka, dapat masaya ka, di ba? Tama? Yung iba sa atin, lumaki sa farming communities, wala ka nakitang farmer na nagplant ng rice na nakasimangot. Amen? Wala ka nakitang tao na nag-start ng something na malungkot. Bakit? Kasi alam niya, tutubo yun. Alam niya na lahat ng ginasto niya para doon, sobra pa. Amen? When we think of harvest, Think about what you're giving because if you think about being blessed, that's harvest to God. But he said, when you give, no compulsion. Why? Because when you worship, you worship with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you're giving it to God because in your heart, you expect God to bless you beyond, above measure. Now we give this morning, realize those things because these are principles. We give happily, we give generously. What is generous, it depends on you. Diba? Whether you have so much, you want to give that. Or you have so little, you give that. Bakit? Because to God, what matters is the attitude of heart, which is worship. So when we give to God, we're not giving to tithes and offerings. This is worship. And as we come to Christmas, remember those three Magis. They went there not to give regalo. That is worship to them. So when we give, let's give it to worship before God and let's give more than being generous let's give with cheerful hearts and you know what the promise is and God right is able to bless you abundantly so beyond measure so that in all A-L-L all capital in all things at all times having all that you need triple yan you will abound in every good work. God told us that that harvest is more than for us. It's for us to see the grace in giving and the fruit of what you've given. You heard seven words for the last seven times I want us to really internalize that and as we give, let's give with joy. Why? Because it's time to give. It's a joyous celebration. Amen? Let's offer this to God. If you're ready with it, can you just lift it up before God? Lord, salamat. This is our seed. We are farmers. We're sowing not only first to your kingdom, but to our life and family. That Lord, whatever it is that we need, far beyond what we can even imagine, we cannot outgive you. You always give more. And Lord, thrice here, you mentioned the word all. It means, walang natira. Grabe ka magbless. We pray that this worship, this joy of giving, multiplies exponentially. That means, second, third route to Google. That's 21-0. You know how. You know our need. Give us more than what we need so that this Christmas and the years that follow, we will give to so many. Why? Because you will be unstoppable as we honor you. We give with a smile and with joy. This is yours. We honor you. Your name your throne, your kingdom. Multiply the seed as we give today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just give to the Lord.
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Uh, Na-empower ba tanan sa word today? Na-empower ba tanan sa worship today? Amen. Hello. Amen sa worship team. Kaya nabalik. Uh, church, I would like to report to you sa ating munting tahanan and we believe that we are obliged nga amo yun silang uh, among bahibal on tanan kay after all this is our church and everyone is helping with us na send ba ang picture? tama ba? okay so in behalf of the board no, we are very honored to pasalamat kay me last two weeks sa do na joy flow of blessing donation and kung kisa pa tong gusto napatay mga nabilin napatay nabilin nga dapat pamaliton sama sa kanaganing rostrum kanaganing glass palit patana kanang signage uh, TV napay mga ginagmay no? ayaw mo kaulaw doon lang mo I know nga ganahan yun mo mo help so before I will proceed can we Mau na ni karon siya. Happy ta jud. Next. Next. Na install na nato ang uh, aircon unit sa mga dugi pa dali no, ang aircon. Okay, next. Atong stage, hapit na. Ato ang uh, puyer or receiving area. Ato ang kids o katong toddlers. Dili na na sila mag lumbaan ay ilog sa chair. Sige, forward, move lang. No? Kani ato ang admin, pastoral office. At the same time, a pantry and nook. Nook. Kana sila. Kasi yeah. Move. Yeah. Gahapon ni nga pictures among gi assist ang area, gi reassist namo. Kaya hon jud mahuman. No? Okay, stop. Mo ni ang team dito gahapon, no. Uh, unfortunately wala si Architect Makoy. Kana mga nagtabang diha, mga supplier, uh, signage, si Fe, si Pastor Mel, si Tats. Kasi pag gani, yung maklaro. And many others. Nag-collaborate yun natanan para mahabol yun natong na schedule because by 24, kanina nga area manggot, uh, siyempre mag-open sila every 24. And I believe it's the right time na magamit na natong area as rehearse. As rehearse. And 31. Tama ba? 31. Okay. So, church... Napatay mga, kung gusto po mo mo tabang, gusto mo 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 donate, doula lang nyo si Pastor Mel. And last two weeks ago, nag- naghatak mo sa inyo pledge card. Kasi ito yung nakareceive. Ang nadawat na mo, murag lima pa. Tama pa Pastor Don? So, katong wala pa nyo na send, pwede man ninyo i-PM or i-send kay Pastor Don or kay Pastor Mel. Kung gis- kinsa pa ito yung gusto mo pledge, napa kay Sister Jenny Rocha, palakpakan na ito si Jenny Rocha. Hallelujah. No, hallelujah. And also, we're planning to have an early uh, Christmas, I think this is a Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving sa BCI, uh, prior to the 24. But, if the situation arises, example, kaya dito mang God, no, required tag mga karaganing korinting, ang mga kaya ba sa aircon, kaya naghan kaya tag aircon dito. Uh, basing atong ipol na lang sa 24 but tentatively tentatively ready yourself in 20 that is uh, 20 that is Thursday correct? or the 24 kisay ka na handri mag Thanksgiving ta or mag, or mag Christmas party sa 24 na mismo itaas ang kamot umahir raw eh kisay ka na handri separate date sa 20 Klaro na ito, majority na itong 24. Sige lang, we will 
inform you in the GC what will be the proper date. Atong atuan ang lugar, ato silang i-pray, kasi by January, dito na juta siya. Alright, and also, ang chair na ito, no, nagdibog mi asam, kasi na mo yung mga kailang uh, papalitan na itong volume, kay karon sa Dabaw, 50-50 chairs lang. Siguro, madili man ang chair, no? Ano yung nag-bless ato ang chair? So, let's uh, wait, let's enjoy, and let's thank the Lord always. Salamatan na itong gino sa BCI, Pasalamatan na itong gino sa itong mga pamilya na nakakaroon diri o katong wala diri. Amen? Na ay mga pungunta na. Ayaw na lang kayo madugay na ta. Kung na may uh, example, no? na po po yung other concern, kung na may gusto i-share or information with regards to our sanctuary, kanang time, uh, na ay mga details among i-post lang dito sa JC. JC. Amen? Thank you, thank you. Any more? Let's, uh, by this time, we'll request our part of the board. Pastor Ronel, Ansay, Brother Ronel, to pray for the sanctuary. Brother. Uh, before we pray, uh, I'd like to pray sa atong chairman. Salamat, Lord God, for our chairman, Lord God, for the leadership, oh Lord God. It is a part of worship, no? Without the guidance of God up to Him. Wala kita. So, igamit nang sa gino. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord God, for the great plans for our church. We are grateful that you have given us what this church needs, a sanctuary. You are our great sanct- You are our great provider, O Lord God. Thank you for providing all Wisdom, finances, and resources, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for everything, O oh Lord God, that you have touched the hearts of the people, O oh Lord God, to be generous. We believe for where you lead, you provide. Bless those people who help with this, their skills, expertise, and resources, and money. We are more than glad knowing that you are the one moving in this project, Lord. In this mighty name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Ang nakalimot na ikaw, si Pastor Noel. Dito ni two days na dito nagtabang. Salamat kay Pastor Noel no, for your assistance. Praise God. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Architect Ram. And to those who have been instrumental in the building of the sanctuary. Can you grab a person and pray for that person? Please stand and for two minutes, pray for the person. Bless and affirm. Just two minutes, no? Including the worship team. Pray, say words of encouragement, no? By pair, by pair, para mabilis. Okay. Okay, or, or triad, by the name.
please wind up your prayers. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for reminding us that we need to abide in you, in your Son, Jesus Christ. He is, he is our Savior. He is our Lord. He completes what is lacking in us. And so I pray for each one here, individual families, Lord, as a family, as a BCI, as a church, as a community of believers. Lord, keep us abiding in you. Keep us loving Help us to love because by ourselves we cannot love. Let your Spirit finish His work in each one of us. Let the fruit of the Spirit be manifested. Let the gifts of the Spirit be shared. And let your glory be manifested, Lord, be shown and revealed in and among us, dear God. Through our living, through our speaking, through our going and coming in and going out, let the Spirit of the Lord Remain and make us transform in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen and Amen. Happy Sunday, everyone.